40 years ago, young people in Soweto marched against the introduction of Afrikaans as a medium of instruction. On that day, an estimated 176 students were killed. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this very special episode of Anur the Light. We took a trip down memory lane to bring you this story. June 16 marks the 40th anniversary of June 16, 1976, a date holding momentous historical significance for all South Africans. The day was a major turning point in the fight towards freedom against the apartheid government and was the catalyst to what is now known as the Soweto Uprising. With the coming to power of the National Party in 1948, we found more stringent forms of racial practices emerging separation of communities along racial lines. And then in 1953, they introduced the, the, the Bantu Education Act. Now, that was an important piece of legislation because what it did is that it introduced mass schooling for African people. 20 years later, when it came to 1973, the early 1970s, we found that schools were terribly congested, uh, limited educational resources, shortage of teachers. And I think that created a sense of grievance amongst the students. But the trigger for the actual protest was the enforced enforcement of Afrikaans as a medium of instruction, as a compulsory medium of, inst of, of instruction in the schools. So what happened is that the students, the moment that that decree was passed by the National Party, spontaneously students you know, got together, formed an action committee a few days before uh, June 16, 1976, and they took a decision on the spot that on June 16 they would organize a protest march from different schools uh, in and around Soweto to demonstrate their anger, their frustration, uh, and also to protest against the introduction of, of, of Afrikaans as a medium of instruction. And they moved towards where the memorial site is also, where the where the Peterson was actually shot. Police had confronted them, and then an altercation took place and police opened fire. Empowered by the ideals of the Black Consciousness Movement, thousands of students gathered in Soweto to march in protest against the use of Afrikaans in black schools. This peaceful protest quickly turned bloody when police opened fire on the unarmed crowd, leaving thousands injured and many killed. The the target of the march was the Afrikaans language. And Afrikaans language at that time was a language of oppression. So the students were actually expressing what we call a cognitive revolt against the language of oppression. Now cognition is made up of five aspects. The first one is language. Second one is learning. Third one is memory. Fourth one is intelligence. And the fifth one is thinking. And without uh, language, none of the other five, four aspects of cognition is possible. Because without language, you can't think. So it was a cognitive revolt against a language of oppression. We were part of those who prepared for the uprisings of 1976. Of course, we did not anticipate that the uprising would come up. We thought it would just be a protest march. We were anticipating, of course, that there could be problems because our history had always been shown Sharpville shootings that sometimes when we march, it might end up the way it ended up in 1976. So after the, uh, the shootings in Velagazi Street, the demands of young people became more because other students were arrested. We start demanding the release of those who were arrested. Uh, we said we are no longer saying away with Africans. We are now saying away with Bantu education as a whole. Shocking images of the protest spread all over the world with the now iconic photograph of Hector Peterson's dead body sparking international condemnation of the apartheid government. May her soul rest in peace. She was the one, when they came around Velazagaz Street, identified that here is a son, that was Hector, who was shot. She says, I look at this young boy who had one shoe on, bleeding through the mouth. Maternal instinct took over me. I asked Sam Zima that let's put this kid inside the car and take that boy to the hospital. Education was the catalyst for June 16, 1976. Today, it's guaranteed as a basic human right under the Constitution, but remains a contested area in South Africa. 
Recent student protests and activism in education have revealed a youth willing to stand up for the rights afforded to them. In education, I think we've made a lot of strides. Uh, clearly, we have now integrated the system. We do have an unracial system. And the apartheid, we had all the homeland education departments. We have the education department for Indians, for coloreds, for whites, for Africans in the urban areas. And that has completely been dis so the, uh, that has been disestablished. So the systemic change has taken place. Schools have opened the doors. In a sense, we can say the doors of learning and culture have, have been opened already. I think the central challenge we're now facing is to bring up the quality of the education. That the overall you know, qualitative dimension of the education system is what is critical. The students that are uprising now, at a deeper level, they're expressing a yearning for a cognitive revolution in South Africa. And the universities are operating as private entities. They are not putting their resources together with a national education strategy that would solve problems in South Africa. And that reflects that the government does not have a 15 to 17 years education strategy and an education model informed by sound epistemology. So there is no coherence, educational coherence or cohesion in South Africa. 40 years on, young South Africans are encouraged to commemorate June 16 in remembrance of the immeasurable example of the brave men and women and children who selflessly gave their lives in the name of freedom. Above all, it stands as an example of the importance of fighting for quality education for all. Young people should never forget our history and our past. These learners of 1976 paid a very heavy price. 600 and some odd were killed. They actually lost their lives. We don't even know the names of all, all of the 600 young people who gave their lives. Many of them have abandoned education altogether. Because the 1976 uprising wasn't the only uprising among students. In 1980, we had a national schools boycott. In 1984, we had schools boycott. So many young people made very heavy sacrifices, and some made the supreme sacrifice in terms of their lives. There's a long trajectory of struggle, a long history of struggle, and many people, young and old, little children, make a contribution and sacrifice for the freedom we enjoy today. June the 16th became a public holiday, and we should never forget the sacrifices young people made for our freedom. Our book stack and app segment is up next. Faith and Revolution is a collection of essays by apartheid activist Harun Aziz recognizing the Islamic contribution to the struggle for freedom in South Africa, covering a period of 326 years. A fascinating compilation of over 700 biographies of fearless Muslims paying tribute to passive resistors, political prisoners and martyrs, Faith and Revolution provides unique insight into the often nameless champions who have shaped our country. Hijab style has taken the world by storm and if you're considering embracing modest fashion or even just getting ready to style yourself for Eid, why not try the new app Hijab Styles Step by Step, a free download on Android. The app gives you access to brief tutorials on how to wear hijab in a stylish way, along with regularly updated HD catalogue images, keeping you on trend with a range of diverse hijab styles for a new look for every day of the week. Modern technology has now simplified Dikert with a compact tool called the Digital Tasbe. Worn on the finger, the mechanism has an LCD screen display and adjustable straps and vibrates to indicate completion, allowing you to keep track of daily prayers with ease. I hope the first week of Ramadan went off well and everyone woke up in time for Suhoor and managed to enjoy iftar with the family. Riza Hamdulai is a young man going places. He has imbibed the spirit of the youth of June 16 and aims to make South Africa a better place for all who live in it.
June 16 is known as Youth Day in South Africa. It has become not only a symbol of past injustice, but also a shining light for the youth of today as they inherit the freedom South Africa has been blessed with. Riza Hamdile is a young man who is making the most of the opportunity afforded to him through the democracy that was achieved 22 years ago. Riza is a very uh, versatile person. Um, he can fit into any position in which you put himself. So, for example, if we have programs relating to uh, where the ethos of our school is to be reflected, I can call on him any time to give a speech uh, relating to maybe Muharram program or a Maulud program or an advent uh, in the history of Islam, and he can relate to that. Similarly, anything on the academic front or uh, in the community or with economics or with political situation, Riza uh, is very able and capable to comment on these issues because he's a widely read person. So uh, uh, I think our choice in having uh, made him the head boy was a good one in that uh, he brings a lot of value to our school. For hundreds of years, the people of South Africa were subjected to systematic racism, educational oppression, and were forced to believe that what makes one better than the next is the colour of our skin. To me, when I think about June 16th, I get very emotional. Um, of course, given my political background, I am aligned to the ANC party. And that aside, for me, June 16th serves as a constant reminder to all of us as students and South Africans and as youth that we shouldn't take things like our education, our freedom, our democracy for granted because many students the same age as us passed away on that day and they were brutally murdered by the apartheid police and for me it not only serves as a reminder but it's also a symbol of our democracy. June 16th is ingrained in our DNA and I would actually like to see at this school that we that we make it part of school culture to kind of commemorate June 16th and I think that is something that we'd like to pioneer this year. This year saw Reza being elected head boy at Islamia College, an honour that is bestowed by his peers to represent the best of them. Well, the head was not chosen by the drop of hat. We trace him over a number of years. So um, since he was in grade 8 with his other peers, uh, we identified learners with leadership qualities. And we track them all along and until such time when we have to make the choice of choosing our leaders, our prefix. And from there, of course, uh, from the pool of, of prefix that we have, we draw uh, individuals that show uh, you know, qualities that, that, uh, that would uh, sort of give them the position as a head boy of the school. As the head boy, he acts not only as liaison between teachers and students, but also as a motivator and leads by example. The role of the head boy is to act as the head prefect and as the leading student in the school. So along with my team of deputies and head um, prefects, we organize prefect duties. We see to the issues uh, that the students have. They come to us and they complain to us. And we kind of act as a, a, a space for the students to confide in. So if they have issues or problems at home, they'll come to us and they'll speak to us about it. And we basically just have to motivate the students to be the best that they can and to take the school forward. Reza's future plans are already well set, as he's carefully marked out his journey from school to university and then work. For me, my parents have been a really big support. Um, I've always looked up to them and they've always motivated me and that has really helped me and it has really helped shape me into becoming the person that I am today. I'm hoping to study a degree in political science next year um, and hopefully one day um, I will be able to work in the diplomatic corps. Um, I'd like to go into diplomacy. President Nelson Mandela said the youth of today are the leaders of tomorrow. In Riza Hamdule, there is much hope that the South Africa Tata Madiba envisaged is in good hands.
With Ramadan comes Eid. And for those of you who need some clothing inspiration, look no further than our street style segment. Style, I see style as a creative outfit. I see it as a way of expressing myself. The outfit that I'm wearing today is I like the colour green <laughs> for this, like I always go by seasons kind of a thing. So I thought of this season I'll go for a more mm, monochrome or two-toned kind of a look. In Cape Town or South Africa that's slowly changing also we Muslim women can dress modestly and look more fashionable. Like. Uh, my style comes from social media pages such as Instagram, Twitter, and it also comes from what I see on TV. Islam influences myself on what I wear because of what I should cover. There's certain parts that you should cover in Islam, so I base my style on that. Today I'm wearing something more semi-formal, something out of the usual. So I've got a chino on with a navy Chinese collared shirt, a tan formal shoe and a tan belt, and a brown leather strapped watch. Well, I guess I'm covering all the parts that I should be covering as part of my aura, so that's how I dress. So the dress I'm wearing, um, I actually had made for me. I went to go buy the material, I saw the material, loved it, and then um, I usually just have items made for me because I think it's a lot easier than going to buy clothing in the store because I made a dress that has a sleeve, has a full length, etc. So it's just a throw it on and go. Um, I've got the scarf on that I really love. And yeah, I like the colours of the dress. I like the bright pink. I think um, it complements my skin tone. I have friends that do think it's very challenging to be able to be fashionable while dressing modestly or wearing hijab, but I really don't think it's a challenge if you really want to and you make the decision to wear modest clothing, then you really can still be fashionable while doing so. As Muslims, we need to value the freedom that came with democracy and contribute positively to this country. Next up is our cooking segment. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to our nude. Today I'm going to be showing you how to make a seafood curry sauce. The nice thing about this recipe is you could use it with absolutely any seafood. Anything with a firm fish, you could use it for prawns and it's absolutely divine with crayfish. But today I'm going to be using king clip. So what I've got here is some king clip fillets that have been skinned and deboned. I've got coriander that we're essentially going to be adding at the end, mostly for garnish but also for flavour. I've got two onions finely chopped. I've got two green chilies. I've got curry leaves. I've got some salt, garlic and ginger paste. I've got some vegetable oil and quite a bit of it, so don't be scared because I want my onions to really melt down and dissolve. I've got some chilli powder. I've got some sugar. I've got tomato puree, not paste. The tomato puree is a lot more subtle and the, the paste tends to be a little bit too tart. Some cinnamon, I've got some cloves, I've got cardamom pods, and just for that nice licorice flavor at the end, I've got some star anise. I've got turmeric, which helps to thicken our sauce. And the only other spice I'm using is fennel powder. So what I'm gonna do now is heat up my pot, my vegetable oil, and start frying off my onions. So I'm gonna pop in my oil. I'm just gonna top and tail my chilies. So I can release the flavour. I'm not going to bother about chopping these up finely because we're going to blend this paste at the end. So I'm going to leave these in with my onions and this, together with my curry leaves, I'm going to pop into the pot. And in go my curry leaves. And just about a handful is enough. And as you can see, it's just starting to catch on the bottoms so when the edges just start to go brown. And that is a good time to start stirring. Because that's when you know the juices are starting to dissipate, your onions are starting to caramelize. So now you need to keep an eye on it so that it doesn't burn. Okay, now that my onions have reduced by at least half, I'm gonna be adding all my spices, and that is my fennel. I've got about two teaspoons of that. I've got one teaspoon of turmeric, and I've got two teaspoons of chili powder. If you like it hotter, which I normally do, add three, add four, that's entirely to taste. So in with my turmeric. 
my chilli powder. It's time to add my fennel. And you want your spices to roast a bit because this helps to sort of bring out their flavours. You can actually start to smell it after a while because there's nothing worse than having raw spices. So now that my spices have roasted nicely and I can smell all the aromatics, I'm going to be adding a tablespoon of garlic paste and a tablespoon of ginger, as well as my tomato puree. As you can see, the sauce is cooked down. It's still looking quite thick, so to make this easier for me to blend, I'm just going to add a little bit, and this is a guesstimate, judged by the eye, of water. Just... I'm going to pop in my whole spices. Now why didn't I add this in at the beginning is what I know you are wondering. Because I'd like to have a smooth sauce without having pieces of chunky cardamom and cinnamon that you're going to be biting on later on. Here's a quick stir. So in with my king clip. And I literally just place these down very, very gently. And at this point, we don't stir very much because you don't want your fish breaking into lots and lots of pieces. So all that I'm going to do now is add a sprinkling of salt and a handful of freshly chopped coriander. Once this goes in and our king clip is cooked for all of 10 minutes, we're good to go. And king clip served with fresh, fluffy white rice is absolutely divine with some popper dumps on the side. And here we have a delicious pink of curry that's ready to be eaten. So I've got some fluffy white rice. And that, with just a sprig of coriander, is good to go. So until next time, Assalamu Alaikum. Alhamdulillah, that's it for this week. If there's anything you'd like to share with us, please get in touch via our social media pages or give us a call. Until then, I'm Mari Mukwanda, Salang Hantle, Assalamu Alaikum. Mm -hmm.